Hey, everybody, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us again. Um, as per usual, it's been um, a very busy couple of weeks, and yeah, I really appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedules to um, come chat with us and catch up with all the latest stuff that, that's been going on. Um, so, oh, and we, we have uh, Romeo Shaw from AWS here as well to present about some great new uh, open source examples that they've integrated Jetson with um, AWS Greengrass IoT for really cool edge to cloud stuff with um, Gen AI. Okay, so in the interest of time, let me just dive right into what I've been working on. Uh, let me uh, just share the window. Here we go, okay. So as you might recall, when we left off from the last meeting, we was going to go start on some new agents and integrations. I wanted to like clean all that up because all that like spaghetti mess of code that was like in here underneath the agents here. If like, for example, the, the live Vila one was this video query agent and we just like kept adding more and more stuff into this and it just keeps getting bigger and it's it's difficult for people to like figure out how to um, write all the chain all these together and write all the callbacks and everything from like Python code. Not to mention every time you make a change, you have to go in and stop and restart, and um, it made it very difficult to experiment with these. So uh, when I was doing the new ones, I was like let's just do it right th this way and make it easier for everybody. So now we have this like. Um, Agent Studio tool, which is just based on the same plugins as before, except this is all um, dynamic now. So first thing, let's just start loading um, an LLM model. All of these dialogues and stuff are just um, extracted from the actual Python code here uh, that, that you can see. Um, like it, it just gets all this UI stuff from um, the Python functions. Okay, so we'll go load a model here and like takes a couple seconds to show up. Then you, some of these widgets have other grid items that pop up on it and you can chat with it. Okay, next let's start adding the um, speech pipeline to it, which is always a thing like, I'm gonna hook it up like this or that. Okay, so the web audio that like does your web mic, we test it here. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, you can see the, the DB meter going. When, whenever I like start these off, I always like test every single part of it just to make sure that it's all working. Um, with the whisper, we have a voice activity filter on here. Um, so you can see when this is hooked up, it triggers when it goes above 50%, and then you can see this timer starting, and that's the aud current audio segment that it's outputting. Um, what's next in this? Uh, the, it's the actual whisper part. Okay. Whisper takes a couple seconds to load. All right. Um, connect it to that. Let's view the transcript that's coming out of Whisper, just to like independently confirm all that. Hello. Okay, there we go. We see the partials in blue and the final ones in white. So after you stop speaking for like a second, then the, the bad filter, you'll see this go silent. Okay. So it stopped there and it'll like restart. Um, okay, now we can finally like hook it up to model. Hey, how are you? Can you hear me? Okay, so it's getting the input. I need to be careful about muting myself now. Um, okay, next let's add the Hyper TTS onto it. This one's loading too. Right. 
Um, okay, these ones we output by the words. So some of these have lots of different things here. For example, like partial output means as it's going out, it does it like token by token, and it does it the final one at the very end when it's done. Or like this one interrupt after it speaks for like half a second, it'll like send an interrupt to the other ones. This one delta is like every token by token. The partial is the response so far. The final is the one that comes out at the end. Words is word by word. Embedding is just like the embeddings from them. Um, yeah, there's lots of different ways you can mess with it all. Mm, Sometimes, okay, I like to put this rate limiter in there on this. I can explain why later. It's just so like it keeps the audio synced on it. And then the output is web audio out. These other audio devices in here are um, for if you have like a USB one attached direct to your um, Jetson device. Okay. Let me hook all this together. Hey, what's two plus two? Okay, did you, I don't know if you guys heard that through the speakers or whether that's set up all right. Um, but it, it was nice. So obviously it's like a lot of different steps here to like get this, um, we'll make it so you can like insert different configurations or whatever, load and save them, whatever. Um, but this is just like the start of this. Let's add more stuff to it. Next, let's get into the video. So, um, I have another USB camera attached to this thing. Let's see. Here it is. Okay, let's monitor it. This one sets up the WebRTC. And the nice thing about this now is you can put in like video files or streams or like whatever you want. It's much easier to configure than it was before. Okay, let's open this widget. Let's reconfigure these. These are all dynamic and drag and droppable now. You can refresh the browser. It'll like keep the window the same. That was like a whole thing figuring that out. Um, okay, let's load another LLM and do the vision language model stuff. So it's the same thing. Um, you can type any model into here. I just have some like common ones pre-populated that I have. Okay, but this one, it's loading down there. Yep, it's going. I wish I could show this in like 4K for you guys because um, it ends up taking up a lot of screen real estate, but not over Teams. Okay, so let's. In order to do well, basically, as soon as I got the skeleton of this up and running, I went to like recreate where we had with all the agents so far. And in order, there was some like hard coded stuff in those video query and like llama speak agents, right? Which is why that spaghetti code got difficult to follow and just keep adding on and on. So I went through and added some like logic blocks and prompters in order for the VLM to automatically like repeat the same prompt over and over, there's this templated auto prompt thing where it takes in different tags of like, you can put in a different number of image tags and it'll fill them based on the last N images in the queue. Or you can put in text in here and it just like combines it all from the history that you have. So in this current configuration, it'll take the most recent image and then put this prompt in there and then reset it after. So it's just a single image one. All right. Um, so I'm going to connect it to this. All right. Connect to that. See if it's going. We can close this window. But then, all right. So we see that it is running there. It's just going very fast and refreshing since it does that reset. Let's add the video overlay onto it. Um, okay, so there's a video overlay plugin. These are all just like 
basically broken up the previous agents into smaller plugins, which I meant to be doing for some time, but it was finally time to like rip the bandaid off that, right? Okay, the video overlay, it can take in text or images and it'll overlay the most recent ones on top of each other. Um, I'm gonna disconnect this now, reconnect it, the overlay, you wanna get the output as it's going. And we connected to the output. There we go. Okay. It started popping up. We can um, change the query here. Um, all right. You guys are familiar with like the VLM stuff by now, so we don't have to dig into that too much. Um, let me show you how to change the prompt without having to go in here and like edit all this by hand. So we'll just like add this to our template, text input. Then like the user prompt, it's basically just like a text box that comes up, connect that in. Okay, so this makes it real easy just to like change here, whatever you want it to do. Now it's going off much, much longer. Okay, back to being short. Another fun thing that you can do with this, you see one of the most really valuable things about this is the real time feedback on like all the performance and everything that you're getting, um, we can like reactivate the uh, the other pipelines here too. Hey, how's it going? Can you hear me? You can see like all starting to, it all activates once the uh, mics are on and everything. Um, you, you can see like how fast certain parts are running. The, the video camera is running like way too fast um, for the whole thing. So let's add in another, Rate limiter on it. Um, let's slow it down just to like 15 FPS here. Okay. Reconnect it. Disconnect this. Okay, so we, now we can see it's running much more in like a normal rate. And you can like open this back up and say like, oh, I want it just to run at like five hertz in, instead, and it'll go slower. Oh, well, I did I did mess up one thing when it, which you can see is like lagged out now because I didn't set this like queuing method to it. Um, Let it catch back up. All right, now it's back. So that drop inputs one, this, this one can actually be kind of important. It, it specifies, does it let the queue grow behind it or does it only take like the most recent one? So now my like, video is looking a little laggy. Let's like speed it back up. Um, but I mean, I think you guys get like the general idea here. There's like, I'm gonna keep, adding blocks into all of this, logic blocks. There'll be, there's already callback plugins in the system, but I'll have like a little editor in here. You can just like write a simple function. So like, oh, I'm gonna check if string X equals Y or something and pass it through easier than just relying on these different um, ones that, that are already in here. You'll be able to like save and load the agents, deploy them to a Python file that it generates because it, it's all very, um it, it, it's it's very templatable now it's based on this um dynamic agent that it can build on time and it's basically like a list of plugins and gets them all from like the server or 
I know people were asking like, well, how do I do the WebSocket protocol just from like another client? So you can just automatically control this. In fact, a lot of these, a lot of the piping from the, from your Jetson into the web widgets is just done through like these plugin connections. So there are some hidden ones in here, for example, like the chat transcripts and other things that it, it inserts a connector into that and automatically receives the data. And it's like lightweight RPC that you can call Python functions over JavaScript and give it a, a dictionary of the arguments and it'll just like go and execute all of that for you um, and makes it really easy to, to add things. In. Okay, there's one more bit to show you guys that will be the database side, the vector DB side. Um, this will essentially get us back to where we were before. Let me see. No, it froze while it was loading there. So one thing I finally did do while I was refactoring all this was separate out the NanoDB is now in its own GitHub repo. The clip implementation is now in its own repo and um, has TensorRT in there, which is good because these both NanoDB and Nano LLM and a bunch of other stuff relied on this clip. And I was just like copying the files around and needed to fix that. Um, okay, so the NanoDB loaded. Here we go. Let's see, where's the widget? So many widgets. I need a bigger screen resolution. There it is. Okay, let's turn some of this off. Uh, disconnect the auto prompt. Let's go turn off the VLM. Okay. I mean, it is kind of cool. You can like just reconfigure things however however you want. Eventually, this will get very powerful. You can already see it just in this little demo here. You'll be able to, you know get lots of these all piped together and different systems and all kinds of stuff. Um, okay, here it was before, like you can do the, the text query, just take some time to um, load all the images from the server, things like that. Okay, so that's showing the text image and you can see like the performance shows up um, on the, the node here. Let's show like in the other, previous demo how we like automatically search the current image in from the feed into the database. That's really easy to do because um, the DB just takes in an image input. There we go. This is running too fast. Um, yeah, this is running probably too fast for it. Let's slow this down. Was essentially, it was like it, it was working before. You can see like the metadata popped up in here. So this DB, it um, takes in an image or text and outputs the search results. This is just one client of those search results. Um, I'll add more elements in here for doing RAG that will then like put it back in through like the auto prompter and into your system prompt, just like it was before, except now it's all just in these blocks that that you can go do. Um, but yeah, it's has all these different elements in there. We'll continue adding them. I think I showed you most of the relevant ones today. There'll be other like data tables in there. I just add that. Th this will be really easy to um, help chain all these things together and um, quickly develop these agents because it, it was just taking like so much time to um, actually develop them and just to start and restop re every time and it takes like two minutes to load the models and i think this will help people a lot to put all this stuff together experiment with different workflows pipelines the only thing that is not in here that was before was the function calling okay 
is actually still in there. It's just the interface for turning it on and off is not yet. And I wanted to let it marinate a bit how to best represent those this time. And with this latest release of Home Assistant 2024.6, there's been new APIs for function calling in Home Assistant. And it's um, starting to get like a lot of traction here. And look, they, there we are. They, they posted our video from uh, the, the last meeting when we turned the lights on and off with, with this. And it's really great to see the, the support of um, the Home Assistant community in this. We'll, we'll dig into like what this spec looks like in a different, in a few minutes here. I, mean, I want to get your feedback on it. But what I'm getting at here is how to best expose all of this pipelines and features. And we're only going to continue adding to this, all like the VITs and vision elements and stuff, how to, how to best expose all of that into the system so that in the future, we're not constantly having to refactor things. And because eventually we want the bot to be able to control all of this itself. And what I'm coalesced on is having the bot function. They're, they're just other ones in these plugins, right? Because not only do some of them need configured, for example, most of them have like API keys and URLs that you connect to your home assistant server, or like the AccuWeather. API key or whatever. So those like those need configured when you first create it. For example, like you go in here and create a new thing. You want to be able to put in all that stuff in there and configure the options for it. And then it would pop up and then you can pick to turn it on or off from there. And it will automatically enumerate the like, like right now, the way it works is um, there's this bot function decorator, then it extracts all of the function calls from that, puts it in the pedantic tool format that the model wants put into its system prompt. So essentially, it would just do the same thing with these plugins, except that it, it's much more dynamic. It can dynamically enumerate the system and whatever's in there. And you'll be able to control it from the UI which ones you wanna you wanna give it access to. Um, so that that should be pretty easy to do from here. Now that um, we have a good handle on this and be able to to do all this stuff. But yeah, this this tool will be super powerful for everybody. I'm real curious to hear what you guys think. What you think's missing? What do you need and want in order to go off and start experimenting? on agents that like actually do um, real stuff. So with that, we can like stop for questions for a minute. Um, I've already talked for like 20 some minutes. And if you guys have any feedback on this, that would, that would be great to hear. It's awesome. I don't have any, I don't have any questions, but this is really cool. All right. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, it, it was a uh, um, the first week last week was like just getting all the the skeleton of this going. And then um, this most re recent week was getting back to parity with with where we were at before. Um, but I plan there'll be a menu on here where you can load and save this configuration It's already almost there. Like the state of all this is. Um, will be there. Yes, you. I need to rebuild this container. All the source is on there. You could technically go out and rebuild it yourself. I will rebuild it and put a page on the Jets in the Eye Lab showing how to run this. It's a very. It's all you have to do is um, run this um, nano llm dot studio command. Here it is. Just this one. It starts what's called the dynamic agent, which. Um, is able to dynamically instantiate plugins and like remove them and, and everything. But yes, it will be on Jetson containers. This could be a development tool that you can then export to Python and, and then run it wherever. I think in the grander scheme, this will be very effective at pulling in together all different types of things that you need to add in because that plugin architecture is very lightweight for 
for doing things. Um, it'll be really cool to see where we go from here. There has been a few of these tools pop up this week, like Steve, I know we were chatting on LinkedIn about this, and it would seem to be where folks are, are heading next with things. And I know like when I start coming out with stuff at the same time, seeing other people doing like we're on to something here. And um, I think ultimately tools like this will ungate people to, you know, generate the the next thing, next agent out there that might not have really been possible to do just editing the the source code or whatnot. Um, Quick okay. question, Dustin. When yeah. when you were saying function calling, is that function calling from Home Assistant, or are you talking about tools like within the LLM? I'm function talking about the tools. Yeah, you're talking about tools. Okay. Yes, I'm talking about like how, how I want the functions of the system and what the bot can call to be one and the same. Yeah. Okay. So like all of these plugins, it would have been it would be able to like control these put data into them and out of them, basically following the same WebSocket protocol. And it's just like architecturally how to best um, enumerate all that. And it's just like, well, that that plugin API already um, supports it. So this, yeah. it, the actual, the, all the like the plugins and all that stuff, they've been quite stable and in here for a long time. I've built around this for the, the better part of a year now. So this plugin, interface it basically is just this like process call and put the data into a queue and this can be very open-ended what kind of data it is it could be audio video text whatever um and then there's these functions to add it add connections in there and, and all this stuff right um what would what would be interesting i would think is you know adding a an optional um, an optional Boolean or jumper flag or something like that, whether a function is human callable, bot callable, neither or both. Um, and if it's human callable, you can put it in your workflows. If it's bot callable, you give the bot to discretion to call that function when you type in certain things or when it receives certain input. Um, or it sees certain things, right? So it kind of be just a, a, a flag to start and you could always parameterize it later. But you're, it's yeah. autonomy. Yeah, for sure. And I think even in the previous one, there, no, okay, no, I never had like a checkbox for each function. And what I've actually realized is it, which ones are enabled is also dependent on which one, the model. So like yep, we already showed you have two models in here. I, I even did like pipe them together and um, you, you, you want to do something fun here. Um, I have with like sil silly tavern is also kind of similar um, to to this and um, sorry I shared my entire screen again so the window um, silly tavern allows you to hook multiple agents together okay right? and you can do that with this too but it's just we don't necessarily have a reason for that yet we we we, we very well might once you get things going so let's pick like another well you could mimic an here. moe it, you know instead of having an moe model which might be too big to run on certain jets and architecture you could have routing through chaining multiples yeah. together yeah for th that that could be interesting too i've not really gotten into those but um why is it like frozen my thing here that's kind of strange okay maybe the uh Okay, we'll just load the little one, little mini shear llama. Nice thing is you can keep track of all the, like the memory usage and GPU and all that. Now this is, this is a lot of like a profiling tool too, yeah. which is like really difficult to do at, at this scale without this visual representation of everything. Okay, so we're back in here. Let's reset this chat first. Oh, I don't, my my keyboard is laggy on my uh on my laptop for some reason. <laughs> okay, so what were to happen if we can do a little fun experiment here? Let's like disconnect this. So we'll send the output of this one there. The output of this one to here. We'll kick it off. Watch it go haywire.
There it goes. <laughs> They're just like chatting with each other. We'll just uh, it, it'll probably crash after I uh, after it exceeds the max context length. I don't know that I have like the wrapping all in there and working and stuff. Um, so you can make a rap battle bot. And that's pretty much. <laughs> yeah, but again, like those silly tavern guys, they they've been doing this from like day one. They're all mm-hmm. into like the, the they have really advanced like character prompts and stuff and like. Just have them going back and forth. Yeah, th- this is this is a very funny byproduct of of all this, though. They just, but eventually you can already see like how advanced this stuff. We have like so much data going, and like uh, th- this is going to get so awesome, and I think will engage um, a lot of stuff for us in the future. Because you saw, like, yes, I'm I'm still even like learning how to do this all myself. Eventually, we want um, Jitoku Jets and Copilot to sit here and help you with it. Be like, oh, maybe like you want to do this or put in this um, template of, for example, the voice pipeline or um, give you suggestions on things and eventually control the whole the whole thing um, adaptively. Um, all right. What were we talking about before I brought that up? You, what, what was your what was the nature of your question again, Steve? Oh. Um, now I don't remember. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was um, oh functions. I was wondering oh, if those function, were tools, right. and yes. we were talking yeah. about. I know I wanted to get back to that. Yeah. yeah. So yes, is the is the function long? It will be enableable per model. So for example, oh yeah, that's the reason I brought up both these models. Is like this one has different settings than this one. Okay. Mm-hmm. So in here, there will be like a selector that you can say, um, it gave granted access to these such and such models. And for ones that require configuration, first you would add them to the graph. So it would be like a tools menu here and be like home assistant connector or AccuWeather API or your robot controls or whatever, you know, that, that you custom define for it in addition to whatever the Okay, it's like officially gone haywire here. It's it's blown past its context <laughs> length. Um, yeah, let's 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 stop it. Okay, before it totally bombs out. Um, yes. So the the functions will be automatically um, be able to turn on and off and be extracted from the API and. Uh, we, we've messed with this enough now, gone through a couple iterations of it. It wasn't exactly easy to, to get right, how it's most easy, easy to expose it and everything. For example, these are like the location ones and there's other ones in there. We want to make that easy as possible. And you also be able to add those, like well, I'll make a little text editor in here that you can just um, add your own functions to without having to like, figure out how to SSH in or, or whatever. And ultimately, once we like document this and work out the, the kinks and usability issues, anybody will be able to, to use this and strikes me as will be useful beyond even just Jetson. Um, and there would really be nothing to prevent this from working on x86 either. I know from watching like the Home Assistant community that there's a lot of like GeForce users and other folks that that are running that, and they could make use of this stuff um, stuff too. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I think is the sky's the limit from here. This these tools are really kind of what we needed to to move forward. Um, I appreciate you guys your vested interest in in this group and working all together. On this, I understand things still aren't easy to do, um, but you know that's life at the edge. So we we try to get there over over time, and I think that this was a a good step in the right direction. Even to, like it's so fun just to go in and mess around with it. I'll get the docs updated for this, and you guys can can start playing around with it and beta testing and um. For sure, there will need to be a lot of like logic blocks added, like if sans. Once you start getting to like the prompt engineering part of it, which a lot of those other tools, uh, some of those other ones that came out um, this week on GitHub, kind of like 
same situation we're talking here. Those, those are much more detailed in like the text side of things and like chaining together mo more like lang chain versus like this is like more for like multimodal, but it's really just a matter of what blocks are are already added in there. But the, that'll be easy to to add all that in there now. In addition to like nano owl and other vision models and and things like that. Um, and then from there, we should be able just to um, have it control the, the whole system. We're still only limited by which models do the function calling is the is the main thing. It's still just that that news Hermes one is really the only one that we have internally. They've started looking at it, too, um, because they're like, oh, this is really cool what you guys are doing. They saw the, the light video from last time and um, want to add those type of capabilities in for real world integration and, and stuff because um, people so far have been very focused on RAG and that that's great. Another thing I want to do with that nano DB, um, the reason that it's in there where it just takes that input stream is just to start logging all of that. And those like rate limiters are all very useful for saying, well, well like what rate do you want to log it at? Maybe there will be some like event detector on front, like nano Al sitting on there, or a change detector or whatever. And once it picks something up, it runs it through the VLM and then saves the output tag. When I was doing that clip TRT um, refactoring, I was playing around more with like mm -hmm. which I, I didn't realize that SIGLIP and CLIP are actually do behave kind of differently with different modality comparisons. Okay, so they're both very good at image to image search. Um, they are also obviously good at text to image. Clip is pretty good at text to text, but Siglip is is not great at at text to text, and um, or or vice versa. So it's really just a matter of the those models were trained for for slightly different things. So we will have to see which one is most appropriate for the the type of rag. Um, and I also had a thought that maybe we would, you could do traditional text-based rag on the side based on the, um, based on the VLM output. So you can, if if you have a user query like, did the mailman come today, or you're searching for something in your video stream, okay, first you can narrow it down by running text-based rag on. The, the annotations that already came out of the system. Once you find the, the highest image, then you can run it through the higher end multimodal um, embedding and get back like the actual image match for it. So then that might be like a, a two stage thing. Because I'm not sure that there is a multimodal embedding model currently that like excels at like everything. You know, they all seem to be tuned for some specific search strategy. Um, so if they're really good at image to image or text to image, they might not be good at text to text um, the the same way. Although the again the original clip was um, good at some things that SIGLIP wasn't, and vice versa. So all of that is like good to characterize and and see how see how things are going with it. But yeah, it, eventually my concept here is basically just have it take the event table from the system, including your stuff that comes from Home Assistant, and run it through that every so often or when new events come in, and then let it respond. Maybe some things are like, oh, I should alert the homeowner or, you know, take action, turn the temperature down or, or whatever. And um, yeah, I, I think the, the Home Assistant community themselves are, are have been moving towards There are a lot of people that, that are out there um, trying it. So we definitely want to help them however we can. And we'll take a deeper look at those new APIs and also the um, get the vision language model in there, some virtual sensor. Um, Zai, you had a question, buddy. Thanks for coming again, too. Oh, absolutely. This is a pleasure. This is amazing to uh, see you go through this. Uh, so thanks for doing exactly. that. My, my uh, question, couple question. One is uh, the... Uh, 
platform you're running this on? Is this the, actually there's a question in the chat. Is it the uh, AGX or an AGX or the Nano? It is. Yeah, no, it's the AJ, and it, it's probably real small on your screen, but if you look at the top right, it says the memory capacity on it. I was wondering, yeah. yes. Yeah, it's sixty. It's 61 gigs, okay? So, and, well, I'm currently at 33.7. <laughs> so yeah, even, it even looks even like so, the GPU is even very low usage well, it, there. Th that is the interesting thing, is that what you, you it's idle, Except when, well, I'm not running the video camera on it right now. I'm not doing, I turned off the live VLM. But yes, it, it normally, it, because the, on the audio side, that bad, the voice activity filter turns off the audio stream unless it detects a voice. So whisper doesn't run. And then the LLM only generates when it gets a final transcript or you type something in. The same thing as like the nano DB. So most of the time the system's actually like, pretty idle and is left for like the VLM or doing like lots of other function calling and stuff. But yeah, it, it will continue to be an issue optimizing all this for, for nano. But th this tool will be very nice for that too, because you'll just be able to visually see like, oh, I can load it up with this much and I have this much memory left as opposed to just like kind of guessing in, in Python script. And it was just taking so long to to develop all of this, given the heavyweight models that are involved and everything, and all the constant stopping and, and starting of things, and you just like I reconfigured all this stuff, you know, dozens of times in just showing it to you guys now. That would have taken um, much much longer, um, having to to hard code it all in there. So that's not to say when you go to deploy it, um, it won't be, and you just write a little export script for it. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, um, I was wondering, as far as like running it and keeping up with your resources, do you recommend just running a, a JTOP next to it? Or are you going to add like a, a UI element there to, to simulate That's a the great, JTOP? I don't, I, I guess we, we could. And again, like I, I really want to get like you guys involved in like, writing more plugins for this or like other other folks from nvidia like like we um got sammy and nigel here on the call they're from um the metropolis teams and and uh hollow scan so we can uh it, yeah sammy we we can write different plugins for that and bring in everything and we will get raphael to do like a j top one and better visualization for that but yes, for now, you can just like run it along the side. I guess the issue will eventually be that like I added the, the console output even in there and like pipe that over, right? Because eventually the, these people won't have that, that kind of access. And I end up seeing this like as the dashboard to like the AI system. And it's funny, it's already gotten to be in like the sci-fi movies where it's like, they show the screen, there's all these like wind the sliders and like controlling the personality and like <laughs> we got it, man. There's so much data, it's like flowing and yeah, it's 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 really awesome and exciting. I feel like to be able to like harness this, you know, and just build it out infinitely. You can see so how there 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 could be systems with like dozens and dozens of nodes in there controlling everything. And, yeah. So a JTOP plugin does make sense because we want this to be the dashboard. We don't want them to necessarily have direct access to the system. Yeah, yeah but I'm just like from an ease of use standpoint, you know, they they might have a harder time doing SSH and more yeah. so and more so I am going to like, okay, how, how can we make this real for real people to benefit their daily lives while, you know, privacy is a, is a major concern. I think if you took like a, a random poll of people worldwide, like how do they feel about the future of AI for them? Probably wouldn't be feeling too great, you know? And they they want to see how it can like work for them and in a way that doesn't like compromise their their privacy. It's becoming increasingly an issue in mainstream um following. And like this has been on the forefront of our mind for since day one, you know, with like edge computing and everything. The, the difference is like it, it's a lot harder to do, right? Even though we have this amazing Jetson embedded CUDA, that, that's, why, that's why we're here, you know, 
in, in Barracuda. Um, that, but it, it's still not easy to to get it and like configure it and set all of it up. Hopefully, this playground helps people to to mess around with it, and perhaps over time we'll get it easier. Like I see it going, saving little chunks of this. And then being able to like insert different parts of the agent so I don't have to do it again every time. Like, oh, here's like the ASR part of the, part of the pipeline. Or here, here's the live VLM. And the, so they'll just be able to insert those different chunks and not worry about like what rate limiter setting you need or whatever. Or like maybe the Jetson Copilot co Code Llama will, you know, figure that out for us. And um, they, this tool can both be at a low level and at, at a high level and make it easy. Eventually, we want to just be able to offer like an appliance, both for smart home or like robotics or um, NVR, all types of IoT stuff that that be able to to leverage this. Um, let me catch up on. Um, you don't need to read my whole. I was just AI uh, in the box. Yeah, yeah. The um, it's some optimized code. I don't know if it might be worth looking through, but they really streamlined the flow. Exactly. I mean, you know, I think I mean I I got it running on this is my beautiful cardboard uh, case here, but this is a full you know input output the whole works. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. On a much smaller capability than what even a dev kit has, and so maybe there's some nuggets in there that I couldn't ascertain. Yeah. Or like we're we're also always looking for like thin client, you know that. Yeah. Uh, and I know that the home assistant guys are um, starting to look at that too, and that that's constantly a thing. Either you need some like robot down there, or you're going to need like speakers set up. Um, and I think even if people like do access this thing through their phone, but they they have a a VPN on their their phone back to their home network, um, that that's cool too. But I guess what I was getting at with the whole local thing, like people, the chat GPT apps or the, the Apple one now that, that launched yesterday, um, it is, it's all about like the ease of use, right? So we simultaneously need to advance the state of these agents to where they're actually capable of doing real things in the real world and make it very easy for people to, to use and customize for themselves. And I feel like we'll get there because we've, prototyped a bunch of these agents like kind of separately and like got the lay of the land. We spent the past year optimizing um, Steve, like with all, all the pipers stuff, all these, all this stuff these hand and box have done. There's a lot more focus on SLMs now, these like yeah. Lorax, lures and different decks and techniques everybody's doing. So we're like constantly keeping up with that on the model front while trying to push these agents forward. And um, while trying to make it all super easy to use, so it's a, it's a lot all to to handle all at once. Um, but uh, yeah, super exciting, and we'll continue to build this out. I'll get like the docs up in the containers we built, and um, we'll if you, if you do try it and have any trouble or feedback, things you want to see in there, please do let me know. I I think in the future we'll get some good mileage out of this and be able to creatively expand our horizons in ways that we might not have done if you just had to like write all the Python mm -hmm. code for it. Um, Cause I found myself thinking like, oh, if I like engineer like this or like white whiteboard down like an idea that like maybe it would connect in this certain way with like the database and putting it as like, no, I just want, I need to be able to try it in about like, two minutes by connecting it all in and see what it does. And um, rather than spend like a couple hours just to like learn that it needs to be done a different way. Right. So that rapid iteration will allow us to achieve this um, cognitive multimodal agent integrated with um, real world systems much faster. Okay, with that, I think we're we're in a good place there. That will considering like we didn't even have that two weeks ago. We will um 
I mean, things are moving pretty rapidly and we'll, we'll see. We're, we'll definitely have the function calling in there. Load, load, save, restore, and the function calling are the things that, that I'm working on next in this. Okay. Can I, can I ask a quick question, Dusty? Sure, sure thing, yeah. Um, I was wondering because, and this came up because of the way that, you know, you've presented this as something that we want, uh, you know, to share with people, people to be able to test this at home. Um, yeah. After when, after we try and figure it out, yeah. Sure, sure. No, no, no. I get that. Um, and I know most of the crew here are are Linux and Jetson users, but what does it take to get something this to like run on Windows with a NVIDIA graphics card? Because I've never attempted to do that. Not, it, this would not be. It shouldn't be impossible under WSL. Okay, like last year or so, I did like some experiment with the jets and containers on WSL. And other than like the display, it, it, everything was fine, you know? Um, it, it would probably be more so an issue with like navigating memory constraints or like you need, need a, a big card. We get, we, we actually end up getting spoiled a bit on the on the AGX 64 gigabyte. Nobody else has that level of, of RAM unless you go with like the, the data center GPUs, right? Um, so that is actually a very nice um, tool for us to, to like, we don't care and just lo load that thing up. And, and yes, the generation is slower, but um, that real time feedback of the performance is um, re really valuable. So I, I think maybe a first step when we get time is just porting it to normal Linux. And then from there, WSL, because um, a lot of this stuff on like the servers and the LLM backends, um, yeah, and that that that's right. Don't marry to arm. Uh, I'm just curious. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious. What was your uh, sort of like motivation or background to like looking into the RTX laptop? Sort it's of because I know I see a lot of traffic on the Home Assistant Reddit of people that are doing this LLM integration on mm -hmm. their PCs. Yeah. And yeah, also I can on local that. llama. Yeah. And like some of this stuff is Jetson specific, but other ones like this general, you know, tool and everything aren't particularly, none of this is really married to ARM. It's just the Jetson containers is a collection of patches to make it all work. Right. So. And you can just add like stuff back in and, and go in and rebuild. And this is all in the spirit of, you know, bringing more people in and enabling them, hopefully making their their lives easier when when they're trying to ex get on board and, and learn about it. Right, right. Um, I was just curious how many people here perhaps like both, I mean, develop both on such, you know, local GPU, PC environment and then on Jetson. Good question. Maybe people can raise a hand. <laughs> they are also <laughs> yeah. having Steve, the, what, what do you got back there? Uh, oh, yep. okay. Yeah, yeah. Of course. I use I use Bedrock for for going production, like uh, AWS oh. Bedrock. That's what I'm using right. there. But local development, that's just a, a 24 gig 4090. Uh, and this guy, just up, <laughs> just up, okay. and then All a right, dev kit, yeah. <laughs> and then a little dev kit down yeah. here. Okay. All right. Yeah, Steve, yeah. You, you, you look into like the Laura stuff on that. That would be that would be great for us to. Absolutely. Well, one other question for you, Dusty. Have you ever have you ever used? I know we don't have much time. Have you ever used like Comfy UI and what they use for? I've, I've not, but like I've I've watched the videos of it and well, stuff. And I hope you don't mind. I mean, I would love to, you know, this is something I can send you some screenshots, but art of the possible wise, this is the kind of stuff they're yes. doing in there. Okay. where we've got four prompts here, four clip prompts. Those are going through their own samplers. It goes through this this hodgepodge oh. of plugins okay. that people have come yep. up with, all to release a morph, where it morphs the four generated images together. Yeah. And when you're talking about what you want to achieve and where this could grow into, all of these different pieces, have they play a part in making whatever you know output of one goes oh, to input so. of the other yes yeah it's just like this so, is a, 
And it, it makes sense that this audience will have already been into this kind of tooling yeah. because of the, their experience with that from their AV workflows and stuff that already do. But yeah, <laughs> it, it's insane the the it complexity is. of that. It, and we'll, we you will, get used we will to get it. Too. <laughs> what did you say that this was? This is called Comfy at? UI. Uh, okay. C O M F uh, Y. Yeah, it's a, it's an alternative to one 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 stable diffusion web API or web UI, but uh, it's called Comfy UI. And you look here, I'm loading a. You're basically loading a Sev Tensors checkpoint. You're loading VAE. You can add uh, LoRa's if you want to to layer them on, and then it's just building blocks to create anything from pictures to animations to audio, uh, all in one place. Oh, God. So, <laughs> is that yours, Steve? Yeah, this is mine. Okay. And did you That's build crazy. that from like up? How? Man. So if you look at add node, again, for the future of your world, these are all of the nodes out there that the community has created over years of different things that you can incorporate um, into any of this. So wow. there's there's samplers, there's loaders, there's maskers, there's clip, there's, I mean, everything you can imagine. And that's, like I said, it's art of the possible for what you're talking about, but imagine plugging in LLMs and sensors and graphics and yes. coming up with things this robust and what that it's, could do in the home. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I knew this is great, but it, it's really a great proof point that like you yourself are doing it. And I, I love the the vibrancy I mean, and these yeah. communities of, of these folks that are like AI practitioners themselves. Eventually, like everybody's going to have to learn how to, I'm not saying it at like this scale, but like the thousand, because like well, if something goes wrong, I'm like, oh, what do you, it, it, it must have taken you a, a long to get the workflow down. Are you running this on an AGX or is this in the cloud? No, that's on my 24 gig uh, okay. graphics card, but at its peak with the uh, models that I'm using at its peak, I think it's using 12 gigs of video RAM. So it can run on slightly smaller. Yep. Nice. Okay. Well, uh, Rome, Romo from Ada was probably one of them. When, when do we get to I'm sorry. that part? He, he, no, he, he doesn't. We, we always go late, um, Romo. Sorry. We can um, transition over to to that, um, to the, the next topic, which you had some awesome GitHub examples that we wanted to break it. And eventually the system would be lovely to like connect in, have like connectors into um cloud systems or like whatnot eventually we have to like interface with everything um if you would like to screen share and give us some background on what you've been working on that would be wonderful yeah thanks for having me uh, i think this is wonderful i think uh, a lot of uh, work that i had been doing on was uh, quite a lot based on some of the containers which you have built, and it's, it's so good to put a face on a lot of people whose names have seen whilst working uh, uh, on you know any of these uh, uh, JSON containers. But yeah, yeah, so likewise, I love bringing like the community together with stuff. So thank you for for coming here today. Yeah, no, appreciate it. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, and what I've been working on is trying to connect some of the. Um, AWS pieces with Jetson and trying to use uh, some of the AWS services to manage these devices. Uh, and also uh, <clears throat> essentially, uh, uh, I mean, just use it to control these devices and then run offload a lot of uh, the compute on the Jetson devices. And with that, let me just quickly share my screen. Yes. and I'm. It I'd been involved or seen examples of Greengrass. It was like back in 2018 or something around the original. So it, it's been around a while and it's great to see you bring um, the latest models and stuff to it as well. Yeah, no, it has, it has evolved a lot since then. Uh, and now um, uh, we're trying to push it even further to include some of the um, Gen AI capabilities by default in it. Um, that's that's uh, great. And like, the AWS guys have always been um, pretty keyed in to, to Jetson and um, they just like really seem to get the whole edge to cloud strategy. And I really appreciate that. Um, and it's great to have you guys as a, as a partner there 
to um, to to push that forward because obviously it's at some point when these systems scale up there needs to be some like data aggregation that that occurs right. for for real world stuff. Yeah, no, I think a lot of um, stuff which we even showed today for the studio as well as some of the discussions because uh, I've been involved in in this research group from the last meeting and I've been nice. hearing a lot about uh, uh, smart home uh, related. Uh, case uh, use cases right yes. and that helps a lot in this like have have a jetson as a hub and i'm trying yeah. to build something for my own personal project just to see if I, if I could leverage some of the um cameras that i have uh and you know run nano vlm or anything of sorts uh or yes. maybe collect connected to alexa and then <laughs> simply ask it i know if, right if is, yeah uh, like let's, port, let's port do the pilot whole... or, or a cat <laughs> yeah yeah i didn't necessarily want to go there but like yo you know people on the alexa team we can like we, we we can make it happen you know it would be lovely to have some like local version of that yeah of course uh, no, yeah, as I as I mentioned, I think a lot of things that I have built is um, based out of uh, Nano LLM, um, the one which um, uh, 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 I believe it's it's coming out from your repository. Uh, but then I've I had to strip down a lot of its front end pieces so that I could connect it to Greengrass essentially. And for folks on the call who don't know about Greengrass, it's essentially an AWS service that just helps in um uh, connecting uh, or at least trying to manage any of the iothh devices uh, so that's what we are trying to do here is um connect that missing piece on an edge device with aws and this is just a very high level diagram as to what i'm trying to do here um is offload a lot of these pieces um uh, essentially the 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 dusty nv container that we have uh, just trying to modify that with multiple other um, use cases as part of it. So not just uh, a VLM, but have SAM or any other models as part of it too, and then use it as a container within green graphs so that that can help in nice. communicating it back to the cloud services. Awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I understand like the um interfaces aren't perfectly in there actually when i was redoing this it was i was redoing it with other non-web clients in mind and it, but it's probably through web sockets it is still right. um but it's like uh, i'll document the protocol sometime and it, it should make that that all much much easier for for folks in the future um yeah, no, yeah, I think uh, um, even the agent studio stuff, um, uh, whilst we were going through that, I was thinking about it, maybe that could be offloaded as something on a front end UI. And uh, yes. it could connect back to, you know, X number of Jetson devices you have, and you could identify which device needs to be connected and which so, device needs yeah. to run a model those, on. Those models were run locally now, but there, there was nothing to prevent one from um put changing the back end to to be networked or or whatnot um which which does make a lot of sense yeah um yep uh, and i have some of the more detailed uh process as to how this goes it uses a lot of aws services um nice. just trying to show a live feed um onto a local network wherever the jetson is connected um and uh, uh, uh provide in any of the requests uh to either run a vlm run a llm any any sort of models actually and then get a response back out of it i'll just quickly run a demo um and i'm using streamlit cool. i think there was a conversation last time about streamlit as well and that's yes, what i'm using too. Use it. Cool. great <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's 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 pretty useful I'm I'm not a front end guy, so I end up uh, creating some scrappy. Yeah, HTML I'm not. Site. I'm not either. But like, hey, we. Uh, if I didn't need such like intense Looking multi good, media, I would not deal with it. Yeah, let me see if I could just. Okay, I'm pointing oh, it back cool. to my community. Yes. Nice. Yeah. So essentially, it's running um, on the JSON device, and it's going through all these. Processes. It's uh, 
sending out a live feed to S3 from where I'm picking it up um, and it's being uh, shown here. Yeah. And then we, we should try to basically recreate that diagram in the Agent Studio tool so that it's like more dynamic and in the in the future. Yeah, no, I think I think that's where um, a lot of the Agent Studio stuff would be sitting in here. And I think um, uh, once you have that, the, the docs in place, I'll try to strip those uh, um, uh, uh, UI part of things. And if I could offload all of that into AWS side, I think that would be quite helpful in at least managing sure. the device through yeah. AWS. Yeah, I think that that's where we're getting with this is there does, there needs to be some platform independence, not only for wider adoption and for helping more people, but also for like client side communication, right? Um, to, to help with that. Oh yeah, of course. I think that could be, um, yeah, essentially those could just be some endpoints which any cloud service could, could connect it mm -hmm. um, and provide request responses to. Um, yeah, so essentially by capture and research, it just sends a, a MQTT message to do what on the device and the device does it, and then we get a response back. Um, okay. In the interest of time, I'm not just going to go into a lot of details, but uh, essentially does the same thing. This is Nano VLM running, um, and then you'll have a response out of it, like, hey, this is whatever. Nice. There so is. It is this streamlet running on your Jetson or in AWS, and that AWS sends the query down? No. So this streamlet is running on my local PC, Okay. Um, okay. which is connected to the same um, doesn't matter. It does, doesn't have to be connected to the same network because essentially what I have is my, it's connecting to a certain um, endpoint URL, which is sitting on um, AWS. So my Jetson yeah. is connected to AWS, is sending mm -hmm. its live feed or whatever it is to that uh, endpoint, uh, which it's picking up from there. And then my, um, uh, when I'm running Streamlit locally, it's it's connecting to this endpoint and then sending get and post requests to either get a live feed or run capture, run any inferences, or, you know, anything. Okay, okay. And my my understanding is correctly that the Jetson uploads the video into AWS and then the Streamlit server pulls the video from AWS and displays it. Yep. Okay, cool. All right. That 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 makes sense because it shows like the scalable nature of this that now technically if people had you granted them access or they were on your VPN or whatever, then yes, they could view their home video feed from anywhere in the world robustly, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's the whole point behind it. And even sending out any um, requests like sending a capture request or even sending a, um, a text request to run inference that also is sent back to that same URL, yes. which sends a message through MQTT back to Jetson. Okay. Uh, okay. And then it sends a response cool. back in the same fashion. Yes. Okay. Then th this type of stuff is super important for like actual, um, you know, industrial use cases. Businesses like every, every, everybody will, they have all these edge devices, but like the communicating data back to their mothership. And typically it's some like secure AWS um, instance or that, that they trust with their, their data storage, you know. Um, that would seem to be quite different than, you know, just turning your keys wholesale over to other um, model endpoint providers or, or whatnot. The more I hear about things, there people do seem to have a sensitivity to running sensitive corporate personal data through um, these language APIs. So um, even if they're running an on-prem cluster or have one provision through a CSP, that seems to you know let them rest a lot easier at at night. So. Yeah, this, this is. I saw. I see somebody walking by there. 
on the feed now. Yeah. It, it would be great to build this out more. And like, so, so what type of nodes do you think we would need in the agent studio to connect to this? Do I need like an MQTT node or is, is there actual like a green grass like API that I can just wrap or how would you recommend that if you, if you could dig into the code and show us where it actually uploads the image or whatnot? Yeah, of course. Uh, so essentially in this case, um, I'm just, th there are a couple of ways to go about it. I think that's a fair question. Um, and that's why I have it here uh, as S3 or Kinesis. Kinesis is an AWS service, which yeah, you can simply, uh, you know, provide a live feed to, and you, know, you, could, you could extract that and you could run it. It's, okay. it's, uh, it's, it's more efficient than S3 uh, because for S3, every instance you're uploading an image, you're updating that image and you're trying to fetch that. So that's not yes. an ideal way to go about. So you're not streaming there essentially, you're just yeah. uploading it. And, and storing that was it a similar objects. thing what I ran to in the vector databases, right? Like when I started that, I was like, ah, oh, I can, like I wanted something to be able to ingest full motion video and do the embeddings off of. And some, while these internet scale storage services and stuff were very good, at that type of thing, that they were not quite tuned for um, those type of real time ingest um, at that at that bandwidth, which is why I just ended up doing like making it all zero copy and and things like that. So and and like the complexity of these cloud systems, I've seen some you know equally bewildering block diagrams to what Steve showed with Comfy UI, although that one still takes the cake out of, out of everything. It's it, it just, that that's gonna like give me nightmares about we're, we're, give give us another six weeks and we're gonna be there. Okay. This is uh but I'm really excited because like now we got this dashboards up and stuff. People we're just gonna start like running this. You know, the sooner that we get have our own systems up, whatever whatever it might be. You know, Ramo is with his like AWS. Um, Zeko got your like smart home dashboard. Steve over there with like uh, who, who knows what. Um, so everybody's got to have like their setup going, and we'll over time just like continue to evolve that, and more and more people will um, follow suit. I, I feel. Um, but yeah, if if you want to show the code real quick of like what the actually yeah, for it. so it so like that. Uh, actually, this, this yeah. is a piece where you would need to have some sort of endpoint connected to and uh, either s3 kinesis or any of the smart home dashboards would have its endpoint so anywhere you could upload your data to um, that right now sits inside the green grass uh, directory uh, within that i have a couple of components one is a docker component which is uh, which just replicates the nano LLM stuff here um, and adds more models on top of it. But then mm -hmm. the edge and AI component is the one which you'd want to look for. And within that run by, you have um, images which are being, uh, you know, well, actually it's utils. So utils is where I'm actually streaming everything to MQTT or I'm uploading anything to S3. So over here I have an S3 client, which um, I'm creating. And then once I uh, 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 you know, get any image from the camera, I am uploading it to S3. So here is where I'm getting the frame data. And here is where I'm trying to save any of the files uh, to S3. Okay, all right. So yeah, you're like just literally saving the um, a JPEG image, which then just shows up through the the dashboard. That, that makes. I mean, this is not typically going to be. Do you do you have versions that do like WebRTC or RTP or RTSP or? No, that's the next step, and that's okay. what uh, that's what this does is. as well. It it does okay. WebRTC, okay. so. That's the next step is to stream that. Yeah. Uh, this is this is not scalable. This is not an idle it, version you would want to it have. Is fine it's, it's a scrappy a version of, of just yeah. yeah. Well, that's the other issue I have with like the web or or the um, home assistant integration with cameras is like it basically runs at one FPS or lower through their RTSP 
cameras. Um, Mosego, others, I don't know if you've gotten it to work. That it uses like FFmpeg for capture or whatnot. And and I don't think it's it's not meant for full motion video or like really required. It's just you want to see yeah. like snapshots. And so like that 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 is fine too. I just want everything to be optimized for people that but need 30 FPS. It. It's it's just too slow as you said before. But uh, okay. I have another take on that. And uh, after seeing your demo, I think we just can do uh, some kind of wrapper for the Nano LM just to incorporate that UI into the Home Assistant instance as a add-on. So doing that <laughs> this way, we could also yes. build on top of that, and we could just add the uh, building blocks for getting the sensor data from a Home Assistant and calling services or using the new AI, uh, API that guys are released in the latest release. Um, there's uh, plenty of options to do integrations. Yes. I did mean to dig more into, because I've been like, I've been so busy just trying to get this all ready to, so that architecturally it's good to expand in the future in all directions that, that we need it to. And the, the penultimate thing, it all being bot callable, essentially. Okay, so that the bot itself can control the whole system, which requires some like uh, forethought about that. But I did want to make sure that the way Homus isn't defining everything, what we're doing is is compatible with that. And is the APIs now? Do they basically just give you back the um, the function descriptions and then? the LLM goes off and does its thing and just calls those? Or is it more the opposite way around, that they are still running the LLM generation and providing it the tools? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if we have Mike on the call or not, because I uh, haven't got any time yet to even test the latest release. So. I think uh, either either way we can do it. That. It's it's fine. Um, yeah. and and even with because one thing about the this project is it's complex because there's so many different kinds of integrations. And I do see the the users in the home assistant forums and stuff. You know, they're 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 sprinting ahead because they are able to get the power of the the desktop PCs, and it is fine for them to run. Um, Olama or whatever, Lama that C++ gets, you know, 100 tokens a second on their 4090 and, and they're good, right? Um, whereas we have, we have more constraints and a lot of different ways to support. So if you, you can look at this like outside in, whereas what I showed last time was outside in. It was, we had the Jetson, it was rest, making rest calls into Home Assistant API externally, okay? But the inside out way would be to like the Wyoming pipeline, essentially, and plug into that. And then there's also the notion of the, o, the Olama integration that's already running. And I know the, the Olama guys are also starting to talk with home assistant folks and us. And it is a great virtuous like community we all, we all have going on here um, right now. But I know what they're looking at the function calling too. So it is very interesting to track all of these trends in like what, what people are working on the past couple of weeks or whatnot. Because a lot of it's like function calling is big right now. These like multi-model agents are big. And now these like these uh, graph tools for them too. So like everybody is, um, we're like progressing that state of the art all, all together. And um, yeah, people are, going out there and making the tools that they need to, to go off and build the next generation of things. So, um, okay. So this doesn't, well, but switching back years to the, the AWS discussion, it doesn't look that that difficult actually to, to do it. I basically just need to put in like a SW, S3 um, node on there that would export all that data to um, your S3 bucket, right? Yeah. 
okay. yeah, I have, I have a few instructions here how to just awesome. get everything up and running, um, mostly through an EC2 or a local PC, and I think you should be in good shape. Okay. Uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah, this uh, uh, a, a lot of this is based off of um, Nano LLM, so I think that should be easy for folks to take it on from there. Um, and I'm planning on expanding the same, uh, and I think I'm, I'd probably use uh, the Agent Studio here now and try to expand that and have multiple models as part of this too. Um, so just just expanding the Docker essentially. Sure. Uh, yeah. But if, yeah, that's that's about. If there it. are bits that's, that's missing from are. that or plugins you need or whatever, um, let me know and and we'll get them over to you in in short order. Um, okay, with that, let, let's try to wrap things up for the day and um, give people the rest of their afternoon back. What, what I will focus on uh, until the next meeting is a getting the the function calling back up and running. As is like a function a tool is just like a plugin, so eventually it'll be able to call anything. Is is what we're architecting this for. Um, and uh yeah the, there's a bunch of other things with the tool documenting it and um integrating the um nano owl and, and other stuff into into that as well and getting it back working with home assistant that's like my main thing is i want to show more uh, advanced functions with that but in the meantime if you guys need anything um feel free to to hit me up. Thank you all again for you know sticking around on uh, uh, this afternoon, and um, really appreciate all your support with everything. Uh, that's great. All right. If if anybody has any more questions or wants to stick around and chat after, I'm I'm happy to. Um, but otherwise, I will leave you guys to it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. All right. Thank you. Th thanks, Romeo, for coming. Thank you. We'll we'll stay in touch. All right. Take care, guys.